So for our next presentation, we have Pacific Grove High School. So I'd like to welcome my partners up to the stage as well as myself to present. Okay. Hello, my name is Sterling Halberstadt. Elaine Kim. And Juliana Heritage. And uh, we have so Sophia Chang, who is a member of our club, but she is currently out of the country, so, yeah. She did a lot for this project. <coughs> right now, there are some 14,485 nuclear weapons that exist today. Over 90% of those weapons are owned by the U.S. and Russia combined. The rest of those are owned by countries on the UN Security Council, like U UK, France, and China, along with India, Pakistan, Israel, and most recently, North Korea. The number of nuclear weapons in the world has declined significantly since the Cold War, down from approximately 70,300 in 1986 to 14,550 in mid-2018. However, of those, 5,100 await dismantlement, but 9,335 are military stockpiles. Of those, 3,750 warheads are deployed with operational forces, with 1,800 of those on high alert short, short notice uh, use. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or CTBT, prohibits nuclear explosions for the testing of nuclear weapons. Although it, uh, has, although it has not entered into force, almost all nations adhere to its guidelines. The International Convention on Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism makes any involvement with any nuclear terrorism, as in plans, threats, or actual terrorist acts, a crime. And the New START Treaty, which is between the U.S. and Russia, which limits countries to 5, uh, 1,550 deployed strategic warheads, 800 deployed and non-deployed ICBM launchers, SLBM launchers, and heavy bombers for the use of nuclear use. These numbers have not, have not yet to be achieved, but the treaty is still enforced between the two countries. There also exist several large areas of nuclear weapon free zones around the world, as shown on this map, but in, uh, in which countries are not uh, able to develop, transport, or support any nuclear weapons. The most recent effort to regulate and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons is the treaty on the prohib prohibition of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> also known as the Nuclear Weapon Ban Treaty. The treaty was crafted at, by the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons or ICANN, which is based in Geneva, Switzerland. It's the merger of hundreds of NGOs uh, or non-governmental organizations coming together to raise awareness about uh, the nuclear threat to, and to enact, enact lasting change. The treaty prohibits states from possessing, acquiring, developing, testing, transferring, or even receiving nuclear weapons. States cannot show that they would use this type of force to threaten other countries. On July 7, 2017, 122 nations voted to adopt the treaty. It was opened for signature on September 20th and signed immediately by 57 nations. Now it is up to 70 nations. It is, as of March 25th, currently been ratified by 22 nations. The treaty uses uh, w agreements with the Atomic Energy Agency and allows countries to leave the treaty under extreme circumstances. If the nations decide to leave, they have to continue to uh, follow the treaty for 12 months after or after an armed conflict has ended when they declare leaving. One of the most recent conflicts concerning nuclear weapons was the North Korea nuclear and missile crisis. This crisis was a period of time between the years of 2017 and 2018 in which North Korea conducted a series of missile tests that could have started a major conflict. In this crisis, there was an intense amount of tension between the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, and the current U.S. President, Donald Trump. Even though the Korean War was stopped by an armistice, the two sides have come quite close to starting conflicts through minor attacks. In 1994, a U.S. helicopter strayed across the demilitarized zone, or DMZ, between North and South Korea. It was promptly shot down in North Korea, killing one crew member. In 2003, four North Korean fighter jets posed an American spy plane over the Sea of Japan, coming within 50 feet of the aircraft. However, these minor attacks seem to closely resemble displays of military provocation. For instance, in 2010, North Korea torpedoed a South Korean warship in the Yellow Sea, killing 46 South Korean sailors. 
If the United States were to claim or assume a conflict to be threatening, the North Korea would be pressured to respond. In addition, a separate case in 2015 was reported when two South Korean soldiers discovered landmines planted near the DMZ. This led to separate gunfire from both sides. With these and more recent tensions in the Korean Peninsula, a mishap or misstep could escalate into armed conflict. Since the election of Donald Trump in 2016, North Korean relations have seen grim due to President Trump's messages on social media. One notable case was Donald Trump's reply to Kim Jong-un on New Year's Day, roughly stating that a new nuclear button is always on my desk. Trump's carefree manner regarding North Korea shocked the United States. Trump's behavior has led to increased ballistic missile and nuclear weapons testing in North Korea. On September 3, 2017, North Korea conducted its largest nuclear test, a thermonuclear blast with a yield of, of 150 to 250 kilotons. In addition, Foreign Minister Ri Yong-ho has claimed that North Korea would conduct hydrogen bomb tests over the Pacific Ocean. It should also be noted that North Korea has had tests in 2006, 2009, and 2013. In the recent years, there were two separate tests in 2016 and another test in 2017. After months of unrelieved tension, North Korea and the United States began discussing plans to progress towards denuclearization. While many members of Trump's administration have stated that North Korea remains untrustworthy, the true nature of these discussions are ambiguous. North Korea has requested that the United States declare that the Korean War is over. Furthermore, the United States must disclose all of its nuclear weapon stockpiles, weapon facilities, and missiles. The comments have, about Kim Jong-un have drastically reduced on Donald Trump's part and tensions have lowered after more recent discussions between the two leaders. The plans toward denuclearization remains unclear and North Korea con continues to expand its nuclear stockpile, but the crisis from 2017 and 2018 seems to have subsided. President Trump has claimed that North Korea and the United States will work towards reducing their nuclear stockpiles, but the agenda for which aspects of nuclear development, of nuclear development will be dismantled will be decided by Kim Jong-un. So our first case study uh, was one on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the basis of the Cuban Missile Crisis was that uh, when Castro came to power in Cuba, uh, he sided uh, with the uh, Soviet side of the Iron Curtain. While he did that, uh, they sent by uh, ships parts of, uh, of missile uh, parts to uh, Cuba and didn't tell the US. And when the U.S. finally uh, found out about this by using uh, by using uh, spy planes, they eventually sent out a picture, much like the one uh, shown up here, that uh, was released to the U.S. public. This caused the U.S. public to start to <coughs> it started to make the U.S. public more weary of the U.S. Uh, soon after, a standoff happened in the waters right side of uh, right side of, outside of Cuba, causing uh, warning shots to be fired at the boats, and then uh, talks to start being facilitated. Uh, and before that, there was the uh, Bay of Pigs, which was a military coup orchestrated by the U.S. government to try to replace uh, Castro from being in power. So, why did the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis occur? One of the reasons was because of bad communication. Since the tension between Cuba and the US was uh, really high, there was not a lot of good communication going on and along with the secret of hiding the missile sites. Another thing was the embargo and the coup. This created a big distrust between the US and, the, uh, and Cuba along with Russia as all sides couldn't trust each other. Then there were both hostilities on both sides of the Iron Curtain, which was uh, the U.S. trying to take over and uh, Castro uh, hiding the missile sites. Okay, so now we have our second case study. And so this is going to be the Camp uh, David Accords. Okay, so the Camp David Accords were agreements between Israel and Egypt signed on September 17th of 1978. This was the first formal peace treaty between Israel and any Middle Eastern country. This deal was handled by the former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and was called the Framework for Peace in the Middle East. Uh, the negotiations happened at Camp David in Maryland, and then both Sadat and Begin were given the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1978 for this agreement.
Okay, so President Anwar Sadat is pictured on the left of this image. President Jimmy Carter is in the middle. And then Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel, is on the right. Uh, because of the contentious history between Egypt and Israel, this meeting was incredibly historic. Uh, prior conflicts between Israel and Egypt include the Six-Day War, where Israel occupied the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt. Okay, so why did these accords happen? More than 30 years of hostility between Egypt and Israel pushed both parties into submission, resulting in the Camp David Accords. The main points of the treaty included ending the aforementioned Israeli occupation of the Sinai Peninsula. The most important part of this treaty was an outline for Palestinian autonomy, uh, specifically for Palestinians in Gaza Strip and West Bank. This was meant to give the Palestinian, pe Palestinian people a voice and lessen their suffering. Uh, on a related note, this is supposed to be a continuation of the Geneva Conference of 1973, which unfortunately ended due to a lack of Palestinian representation. Okay. So the Camp David Accords uh, were not very popular. Uh, Israelis, Palestinians, and third-party Muslims all protested these accords. In fact, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or the PLO, has a direct quote about the meetings, saying that it was... A, co a collusion at the expense of and behind the backs of Arabs aimed at helping Israeli entrench itself on captured Arab land, including Palestine, and prevent implementation of the Palestinians' inalienable national rights. So what were the results of this, these accords? For the purpose of this presentation, we are going to consider the Camp David Accords a failure because the goal of the treaty was never actually accomplished. While the Accords were supposed to give Palestinian people autonomy and self-determination, it allowed Israel to assert dominance over Palestine with the unofficial permission of Egypt. Instead of creating peace with Egypt and Israel, uh, the Accords incited violence and riots and unfortunately led to the assassination of uh, Sadat by uh, militant extremists. So this photo is an example of the continued and unending tension between Israel and, and Palestine. So what lessons can we learn for this, or why are these accords even pertinent to nuclear disarmament? Uh, in order to achieve the common goal of disarmament, we must be able to understand and respect countries that are opposed to disarmament at the moment. For many countries, possessing nuclear weapons as a symbol of power and sharing an alliance with nuclear states is also a symbol of power. Attempts at diplomacy must keep in mind that countries are often unwilling to disarm due to insecurity. Without nuclear weapons, they believe how will they protect themselves. Therefore, we can learn from the diplomatic failure of the Camp David Accords and use the past to help us in the future. First, we must be aware of the implica implications that come from Western interference into Eastern affairs. Oftentimes, Western diplomats have come into situations with a heavy hand and tried to force democratic values onto sovereign nations. Therefore, diplomats should not come from countries with a vested interest in the issue or an ulterior motive. Secondarily, we must respect existing alliances, uh, no matter how small they may be. By destroying the Arab alliance against Israel, the Camp David Accords left Palestine vulnerable and without allies. Third, concessions always need to be made by both parties. So the third point and the fourth point go hand in hand because Egypt and Israel were unwilling to recognize a Palestinian representative in Geneva. They were also unwilling to rep uh, recognize a Palestinian Palestine representative in the Camp David Accords, and those disagreements resulted in a lack of representation at all, which completely goes against what these stood for. No one in the negotiations had the best interest for Palestine at heart, and that resulted in further conflict. Um, for the purposes of time, I'm going to be skipping over this slide, unfortunately, so let's just move on ahead. So as the Cold War persisted, the, group, the United States grew increasingly aware of the possibility that the weakened European states return to the Soviet Union for military security. The idea of a European-American military alliance became a possibility in this Cold War. The Western European states agreed to this idea, and the countries of Great Britain, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg came together and signed the Brussels Treaty, which would become the foundation for NATO. NATO itself took several months to negotiate. The United States Congress was concerned about the language of the treaty and didn't want it to be too binding. In addition, in order for Western Europe to create a collective security, the Western European states would need intensive military assistance to rebuild their defense. 
A third issue concerned the matter of scope. Those who signed the Brussels Treaty wanted this new alliance to be, more, to be exclusive to those signees. However, the U.S. saw more benefit, including countries that could patrol the North Atlantic Ocean, including Canada, Iceland, Denmark, and other countries. And so the, the North Atlantic Treaty was signed in 1949 with the members, the United States, Canada, Belgium, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, and the United Kingdom. The main principle of NATO and the treaty was to consider an attack against one as an attack against all. In addition, the allied countries would have consultations with each other on security matters of common interest. The Warsaw Pact, also called the Warsaw Treaty Organization, was a political and military alliance between the Soviet Union and several Eastern European countries, formed on May 15, 1955. The Warsaw Pact was ultimately formed to counter NATO, and it was built on many treaties that the Soviet Union made with other Euro Eastern European countries. When, when West Germany entered NATO in May 1955, the Soviet Union feared the consequences of strengthened NATO and armed West Germany. The Soviet Union that the Warsaw, hoped that the Warsaw Pact would contain West Germany and act uh, and work with NATO as equals. Soviet leadership also noted that civil unrest was on the rise in Eastern European countries and determined that a unified political and military alliance would tie these capitals more closely to Moscow. The original members of the organization were the Soviet Union, Albania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and the German Democratic Republic. The Warsaw Pact copied NATO's principle of pledging to defend if one or more of them came under attack. In addition, the pact emphasized non-interference in the matters of its members and supposedly organized itself around collective decision making. However, the Soviet Union mainly controlled all the pact's decisions. But by the 1980s, the Warsaw Treaty Organization was troubled by problems related to the economic slowdown in all Eastern European countries. Any changes made in the pact were essentially ineffective. So the question remains, why did NATO persist but not the Warsaw Pact? The first factor was the relative economic stability of each organization. In NATO, the U.S. was able to support the countries that were financially unstable through the Marshall Plan. In the Warsaw Pact, many Eastern European countries continued to struggle in their own states and, and had poor conditions. Their financial state was not secure, but their security was, according to the Warsaw Pact. The second factor was the distribution of power. In NATO, each country was able to have their say in the security consultations. In this way, each country was given a sense of control and autonomy within the organization. However, in the Warsaw Pact, it is noted that the Soviet Union mainly controlled all the activities of the pact and that the members really had an influence. Finally, the last main factor was the issue of internal dissent within allied countries. Within NATO, because the United States was proactive in pr providing support for its allies, the allied countries were able to grow and flourish. The Warsaw Pact saw many dissenting countries who wanted to improve their standard of living. However, the Soviet Union used the pact to lock certain countries under Soviet control. What lessons can we learn from these two alliances? If the allied countries are economically unstable or unstable in terms of the government, they may be less likely to stay in the organization if they feel their position is not beneficial. Also, giving each country autonomy and respect is important. Again, each allied country should be able to have their same discussions. If not, most mistrust may develop as a result of insecurity. Allied countries must be able to have similar goals and be able to compromise. Negotiations cannot be made if the countries cannot agree with one another. Finally, accountability must be taken into account with these alliances. Okay, so our final case study is going to be the START treaties. For the purposes of time, we're only going to focus on START 1. So START 1 was proposed by Ronald Reagan in the early 80s and signed by Presidents George H.W. Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, START 1 in, was initially negotiated by Reagan and Gorbachev in 86 at a Reykjavik uh, summit in Iceland. So START 1 was signed into force on July 31st of 1991 and entered into force on December 5th, 1994. It expired um, in December 5th of 2007. Okay, so why were these treaties created? So the US and the Soviet Union had been discussing the topic of nuclear arms reduction slash the continuation of the SALT uh, talks that led to the um, anti-ballistic missile treaty and SALT-1 and SALT-2, which limited nuclear weapon delivery systems. So the 80s were a time of a popular nuclear freeze movement in the US calling for an elimination of nuclear weapons. And the public support for a nuclear freeze truly helped the government push forward that agenda. 
uh, the Reagan administrators wanted a 50% reduction in strategic weapons, but they knew that it probably would not fly with the Soviet Union. So when Gorbachev took power in 85, he was much more open to negotiations uh, due to the economic problems in the Soviet Union at the time. Shortening the nuclear arms system was quite necessary. So those mutual needs led to the START discussions. START 1 was a success, START 2 and 3 were not successes, but a new START was added to strengthen uh, this talk and these treaties. These were signed by US and Russia on April 8th of 2010, and it limited each side to 1,550 strategic nuclear warheads deployed on 700 uh, strategic delivery systems. It calls and allows a verification regime to improve upon the elements of START 1. Uh, this entered in the force on February 5th of 2011 and will expire in 2021. Most importantly, what lessons can we learn from the START treaties? Uh, communication is vital. The initial communication between the Soviet Union and the United States meant that each nation was able to achieve the goal that they wanted and they felt like they were being heard. Uh, maintaining relations between countries is also important. If the U.S. and Soviet Union had not identified similar needs and worked cordially together, disagreements could have heated the entire process of negotiations and stopped Start 1 before any progress had been made. Public knowledge is also incredibly important. Without transparency and clarity, uh, individuals were not likely to support a new nuclear regime, and the nuclear freeze movement definitely showed the government that the people demanded immediate denuclearization. This movement occurred because the public had free and clear access to knowledge about what was going on with nuclear arms. This could be a reason why START II and START III did not actually go through. The public had not been aware of how many nuclear weapons still existed and did not feel the need to campaign for this issue. Finally, strong verification regimes are always necessary. Verification is what keeps parties in check. Although the governments of the US and Russia as a whole wish to reduce nuclear arms, parties within them have ulterior motives. These motives can be kept in check with strong verification regimes. So that is basically the main reasons of why START 1 were a success. So now we can apply what we've learned from the past four cases. Uh, for first, we learned about transparency. There is an, ur an urgent need for transparency of actions and intentions from the U.S. and uh, North Korea to prevent a standoff from occurring. For example, the nuclear freeze movement of the 80s meant increased public knowledge. This, no uh, this is necessary for the U.S. and uh, North Korea and really all the countries for consistently informing their people. A UN initi initiative to agree globally on a method of informing people could help with this situation and any further situations. We also learned about respect. Since the, since the Korean War, North Korea has been isolated and had tar uh, tariffs placed upon them. These actions pushed the possibility of a, state, uh, of a safe conclusion to the North Korean missile crisis farther away. If North Korea was recognized internationally and uh, the economic sanctions were lifted, North Korea could be able to pursue uh, a safer and more accepted route to ending this. Uh, and one way that we could start this is from the U.S. accepting them on the national table. North Korea has been isolated. Oh, for the third point, North Korea has been isolated diplomatically and economically, creating an unstable situation. The U.S. could do more to support North Korea, such as rethinking the severity of economic sanctions. North Korea needs to have more of a voice on the world stage to promote mutual understanding and security. South Korea can also be tapped to help promote better relations with North Korea and more integration of North Korea into the modern worldscape. Common ground and common goals need to be emphasized along with a willingness to compromise. Also, thank you guys for being patient with us. We know we're a couple minutes over and we will Thank you with these candies during the break. Okay, so for our fourth and final bullet, uh, this one is the most challenging one of all, uh, considering that North Korea or the Democratic People's Republic of Korea has resisted any allowance of verification activities in the past. However, the UN in particular um, is giving, uh, needs to present a united front with the Security Council and give North Korea incentives to follow verification protocols. Given the success of the START treaties, the US and uh, Russia can lead these efforts by demonstrating to North Korea that verification works to both sides' benefits. Type of verification slash implementation that proved to be effective for the START treaties include destructing excess delivery vehicles, intense verification regimes that involved on-site inspections, regular exchange of information on nuclear weapons counts, and the use of national technical means satellites. These types can be incorporated in relations with North Korea and the US. 
So for our conclusion, we propose that we apply these lessons from the Korean nuclear and missile crisis in order to make better decisions. By implementing transparency, we can ensure that we are making the right decisions with full disclosure. With respect, we can bring new nations into gl the global landscape to contribute to global goals. We can sidestep possible problems by understanding all cultures involved. And finally, with precise accountability measures, we can ensure with confidence that we can solve this issue. Thank you, guys.